scripture reading today of God's Word which is in Mark 12, 35 through 40. The other guy, that's fine. Luke. Luke. You don't get it. Do you have right thing? Let's see. Be dressed. Well, the son of Christ, you know how to put it wrong. told us that we could trust in him, that he would not leave us as orphans, that he would send his spirit, and that he would return again to take us home. And Father, we just know that there's no grave that will hold us down, that we can't wait for the time when our faith does become sight. And we just thank you and praise you. Lord, just have your spirit upon us today as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ain't no grave going to hold us down. Not just, ain't no grave going to hold us down. It's, ain't no grave going to hold us down, right? Because we're excited, okay? So let's have some excitement about it, because what if today was the day? Would you be dressed and ready? Would you have the lights burning brightly? That's where we're at in Luke today. How many of you ever played hide and go seek? Come on, let me see hands. Let's see, everyone... There's this thing at the end, right? When the countdown draws down to the end, it says, Ready or not, here I come. Your bulletins show that in there. It's not going to change things. So wouldn't it be so much better if you're ready and excited and working in service, loving one another, ready for that day? Because it could happen today. Do you realize it has been 725,000 days since Jesus said... Behold, I will come again soon. Now we know a day is to a thousand, a day is, a year is, a thousand days is to a year. I'll get it right in a second. Thank you. So that concept of time that we fathom it is not the same as God, but 725,000 days roughly have happened. That's a long time. We see the signs. The signs tell us He's coming soon. Everything else, we know that, that the, the whole creation is yearning and groaning in labor pains. So wouldn't it make sense that He is coming soon, even in our time frame and our understanding of time? It could happen at any moment. And that's what Luke is writing about here. If you remember in Luke 9, Jesus started out resolutely for Jerusalem because He knew the time was come for Him to be crucified. 
And now he's been telling those disciples that are true to him what they should be doing. And here he says in verse 35, to be dressed and ready. And that means dressed in servant's attire, working as a servant, continually working with their lamps burning brightly. Because we don't know at what hour that our Lord might come. <clears throat> There's a change here. In the writing, he's saying, I've taught you, I've told you, I've proclaimed my death. But now we're going to see for the first time he's telling them in Luke about his return. If you've called to be my servant, if you want to be my disciples, take up your cross and follow after me. I will be leaving this earth and you will be in charge of the master's business. And I will be returning soon. And what does he expect to find? But to find his servant working and waiting and eagerly, that's why I say ain't no grave going to hold me down, excitedly awaiting his return. Because that's the joy that we have in, in, in us. We don't want to tell someone else when they ask us about Christ, yeah, ain't no grave going to hold me down. We want to be excited about it. Ain't no grave going to hold me down. Because Jesus told me this, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I know that He said He would return. I know that He said that He went to prepare a place for me and He will be coming back soon. I know that God loved me because He loved me enough to give His very Son to die for me, to do what I could never, ever do on my own so I can count on Him who is faithful and true, who loves me and calls me His own child. So verse 35 says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Well, Jesus gave us an example of serving. It was in John 13. It was just before He went to be crucified. That last meal that He shared with the disciples and shared that intimate time. In John 13, verse 13, He says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. So let's set that up first. First point is, Jesus is our Lord. He is our teacher. The things He tells us are from Lordship. We should do them by His authority, by who He is, that He is God. He is also teaching us. So did we come to learn or did we go to just get an education and then throw it away? To not do as we've been taught. Both things tell us that we should be doing what Jesus taught and what Jesus lived the example. Verse 14, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, He's saying it again. You understand that, right? I'm your Lord and teacher. Now that I have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. That nasty job that no one wanted to do. But I've called you to do it because I did it for you. I gave up heaven to come down and do what you could never do because God loved you. And I did it in obedience and in a servant attitude for you. Verse 15, I have set you this example that you should do as I have done for you. So you can't say there's just teaching and commands. Jesus lived it as well. Very truly I tell you, or listen up, I'm telling you the truth whether you believe this or not, no servant is greater than his master. Pretty simple, but see, we're thick-headed, aren't we? We don't get that sometimes. We think it's all about me, myself, and I, rather than it being about God, His Spirit, and His Son who gave His life for us. If you don't understand that, then here's the second example. Nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And he's using real life examples here, so you can't say that you're not the messenger. You have the job of telling others about the joy, not the joy, that's inside of you. The peace that you have. The fact that you know that you are beloved of God and you will spend eternity with Him. So if you're saved and you know it, then your life should surely show it, shouldn't it? Verse 17, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So we get another promise from God. It's so great when you read His Word. You see these things that you know you should do, and you say, well, it's tough and I want to do them, but I don't know if I can. But then you see the blessing tied to it. If you do it, you will be blessed. Not just in heaven to come, but in this lifetime. There's no stipulation on that. When you do it, you will be blessed. Blessed by who? Blessed by God. 
Jesus' true disciples follow after Him. Live a life of servitude. Not just professing it, because that's what the hypocrites do, don't they? So let me stop back and examine that a little bit in my own life. Not pointing any fingers. Do I profess it more than I do it? Hmm. If I do, then I need to get on my knees and, and ask God for His forgiveness and the power that He has already equipped me with to walk through this life as a servant of Christ. Totally dedicated to my teacher, my Lord, my Master. Not partially. A Lord would not accept partial obedience. And partial obedience is total disobedience. The next chapter in John, chapter 14, kind of mirrors where we're at in Luke 12. Because Jesus is leaving and He's saying, I will return. I will return for what? To take you home. You're saved and I'm not taking you with me now because you still have a task. You still have an obligation on this earth to live as I lived, to show service to other people so that they may know that God loves them. That what you believe is genuine and true. true. To live a life of humble and obedient service. And he says, I'm going to fully equip you for the task so you have nothing to worry about. Not only am I coming back for you, but you've got everything you need to face this world. So in John chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Isn't that what we just heard about in Luke? He said, not to worry about the things of this earth. Not to worry about what people can do to you. Do not let your hearts trouble. You believe in God, then believe also in me and what I am teaching you, what, am I, what I'm living out as an example for you. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Put your name in there. He is preparing a place personally for you just as He poured out His blood on the cross personally for you. And if I go, which I've already said, and prepare a place for you, I will come back. You can count on that. And I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. They should have known it already. But we see this, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way. That's why Jesus and John both proclaimed to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Change your way of thinking, that mindset that you have, that there's different ways to God, that my works of righteousness can, can matter, can make a difference. And remember that there's nothing that you can do. The wages of sin is death. But God did all the work for you and fully equipped you to face the task that is before you in this world. You have an obligation. You have a way of following. Jesus set that pattern. He said, do as I have done. Jesus is the way. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 17 through 24, it says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as Gentiles do, meaning those who did not have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It was foreign to them. In the futility of their thinking, see where repentance comes in, you've got to change that mindset so that you can change your heart. It does matter what I think. It does matter who I serve. Jesus has done for me what I could not do and set up a pattern for me to follow. He has taught me and told me the commands, not just suggestions, and He has lived them out so that I could see that, that servitude. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding and as a result are separated from the life of God. All peace, all joy, all fulfillment. Because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. If they would change their mind, it would soften their hearts. As they soften their hearts, if they would continue to change their thinking. Verse 19, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. I think that statement is still true today in 2017, is it not? Just look at the world around us. Verse 20, 
That, however, is not the way of life you learn. You should set yourself apart and be different so that the world can see that you are different, so that they can see your Father in heaven. When you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Jesus is the way. If you read on in Ephesians 5, starting in the first verse of the chapter, it says, Follow God's example, therefore as dearly loved children. That's what you are. We can call Him Abba, Father. And think about walking in the way of love, right? Talk about walking in the way of love. No, walking, doing in the way of love. Humble service that Jesus gave the example for in John chapter 13. Just as Christ loved and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus is the only way. He's the truth. Satan is a deceiver, a liar. He wants to steal our worship. So when we're not worshiping God, we are worshiping Him. Jesus says we can't serve two masters. We are like the world, what we've called, been called out from. This is not our home. Heaven is our home where our citizenship belongs with God. This is our battleground. This is our witnessing place. This is where we're at until Jesus comes back to take us home. If we weren't meant to be behind doing what Jesus did, He would have just taken us home when we got saved, right? We have a task still here to do. John 3, 20 and 21 says, Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light. Why? For fear that their deeds will be exposed. But, complete opposite, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. You will look different than the world around you. You won't continue in the same things. They will see your joy. They will say, what does this mean? Ain't no grave going to hold you down. In John 4, verse 23 and 24, it says, Yet a time is coming and has now come, while we're still on this earth, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus is the way and the truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and truth. John also records in chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, If you hold to my teachings, then you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will experience freedom in Christ that you've never, ever thought about. The life that God has intended you to live. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is what? The opposite of life. Death, eternal death, punishment, separation from God. But the complete opposite of that, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what are you going to do with that gift? I've got plenty of gifts I've been given through the years that are still sitting there unopened in boxes. They weren't very appreciated or they weren't used, whatever the, the, the reason is. But that gift was given to me for my enjoyment to use. Shame on me for not using it. How much greater is the gift of salvation given to you than any gift you have ever received or could receive? What are you doing with that gift that has been given to you? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but instead the complete opposite, have everlasting life, an eternity, something we cannot even fathom. When I said 725,000 days to you since Jesus said, I will return, you thought, wow, what a large number compared to eternity. We get to spend eternity with God, our Father, who loves us enough that He would let His Son die for our sins. 
John 10, 28 says this. These are Jesus' words written in red. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So you know that that eternity is eternally secure. You have nothing to worry about. So ain't no grave going to hold you down. No one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus. Do you believe this? Are you thankful in using the gift God has given you, being obedient in service? So Luke, in Luke 12, verse 35, we read, we hit this pivotal change. Then be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Dressed is an active verb, kind of like the ask, seek and knock. You keep on doing it, you keep on asking and asking and asking and asking until finally you get an answer. Dressed is the same way. You stay dressed. You don't take off your work attire because guess what? If you're still breathing, your work on this earth is not over yet, is it? It won't be over until you die or Jesus comes again. So you're supposed to be dressed and ready for service. Taking care of your master's business. Taking care and being a good steward of what he's given you from oxygen to millions of dollars if you're a millionaire. Whatever He has given you in this life, He has given you as a steward of it as the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus has gone to prepare the place for you and left you behind with what He's given you in this world to be rich towards God. Ready, staying dressed in servant attire. The King James Version, if you read it, says girded. That's the same thing used in John chapter 13 when Jesus took off and girded Himself with a towel, taking on the appearance of a waiter, a servant. So we're supposed to put on that servant attire. Everyone knew what this meant. It didn't just mean put on a nice thing and preach. It meant put on whatever you need to put on to get your hands dirty to show loving acts of kindness, washing other people's stinky feet. If it shows love for one another then that's what Jesus has called you to do because that's exactly what your master did for you and for everyone who is willing to call upon his name. In John chapter 13, girded is used this way. It says, Jesus, in verse 3 through 5, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist, or girded. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him or girded around him again. So he knew that there would be a day when he would be leaving and returning to God. He knew, and we know that in the next chapter, that there's a day that he'd be returning to take us home. So he set up that example. He got dressed in servant's attire and sat there, right? No, he got dressed in servant's attire and did. He did the example for us. He washed our feet. Washed Judas' feet. Everyone's. Because see, Jesus is the only way of cleansing. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So if you're dressed and ready for service and serving, it's an active verb, then it says, and keep your lamps burning. What does that mean? It means that He might come at any hour of night, right? It tells us in the next verse, like servants who are doing what? Waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. Now it's not saying that Jesus has gone to a wedding banquet here. He went to prepare a place for us. It's using the example that they understood. In that day, masters would leave to go to a wedding banquet or wedding celebration or wedding feast, and they would be gone for however long they were gone. It was a celebration. It could be days. It could be a week. He might return at any time during the night. When does a party usually end? Sometimes we hours of the morning, right? So Jesus was using this example that they knew very well. If a master goes to this wedding ceremony, should you not as servants be dressed, ready to serve, doing the deeds that He has told you to do, so that when he gets back, the house is lit up welcoming him, 
and you're ready to serve Him when He returns. Isn't that what the Master would expect upon His return? I mean, it's pretty clear. That's the example that they're given for Him. So we need to do what God has told us to do. Be dressed, ready for service, keeping our lamps burning. That means we need enough oil and everything too, doesn't it? In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, it gives another account. We're not going to talk about this today. We'll just let you read this account. Which is a different story. Don't think that it's the same story, but it tells you the significance again of someone who is there to wait for their master. Verse 1, At the time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take oil with them. You've got to be prepared. They, they, they thought, here we go, but they didn't know at what time. The wise ones, however, took oil in jar, jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. You're not dressed ready for service if you're asleep, are you? At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, because he's come, and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins were, who were ready went in with him at the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later the ones also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Two totally different stories, don't get them confused, but your points are still the same. You need to be ready. And Luke is telling us here to be dressed, serving, continuing to serve, going and serving some more until that day comes when your master returns. And then you should have your lamps burning brightly even if it's been a long time coming, 725,000 days. You should have your lamps burning brightly so that when He comes, you can welcome Him to His home. So when He returns, you need to be immediately ready to answer the door. So who of you know when the Lord will return? I didn't see any hands like I saw for hide and go seek. You don't have a clue, do you? Do you know what He's required of you though? Scripture tells you plainly right here. So think about that. We don't know when He's coming. 725,000 days seems like a long time. The signs of the time show that it could be at any time. So he could return today, couldn't he? How will Jesus find you when he does return? Verse 37 and 38 have a critical point here. Both of them say in the King James Version, it will be good and gives two examples. I mean, not the King James, in the NIV. The King James Version says, blessed. Verse 37 starts out, It will be good or you will be blessed for those servants whose master finds them watching. That's tied into being dressed and ready and serving. Verse 38 says, It will be good or you will be blessed for those servants whose master finds them ready with the lights turned on, eagerly waiting the anticipation of the return of the master. And it it implies the eagerness also because if the light's just on, but you're back watching television, dressed and ready for service, and he knocks, you can't answer it immediately, can you? Only way you can answer it immediately is if you're right there at the door, ready and waiting, eagerly awaiting for your master's return. Verse 38 says, It will be good or you will be blessed for those servants whose masters finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night, or like what Merle read to us in the second or third watch, daybreak. Now, the King James Version here uses watch. It doesn't use hour. They could use hour just the same. But it's significant that it uses watch because, see, the watchman out watching the towers was watching and ready for whatever it was that was going to happen. They didn't sleep. They didn't rest from that. They watched for whatever it was, the enemy, and in this case, for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To do what? To take us home. I don't want to not be ready for that. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if they come in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. 
and he will reward those. Don't miss out on this. And it's coincidental that we're at that same point, and we discussed that in Romans 14 last week, that he will reward those who have faithfully served him. Salvation is one thing. By faith you're saved. But rewards is by what you do. Okay? Now don't lose me here because a lot of people don't like to think about that because we don't understand that. How can this person be greater than I am or have more in heaven? We'll take the 12 apostles. Their names are scribed on the 12 pillars of heaven. They get recognition. Think about crowns that are mentioned for things that are done. I don't understand it any further than that because I'm a fallible human being and I am jealous and envious and these other things that I have to battle with. But the Word of God says, and Jesus teaches plainly, rewards for those who do what He's told them to do. We just read about it. That He rewards those who diligently serve Him. Here's what it says in verse 37, the second part. Truly I tell you, He will dress Himself or gird Himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Now, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Why would any master come home who owned everything, say to his servants who do his will, or who knows what's going to happen to them, because literally he owns them, and he says, hey, thank you for doing a good job when I got home. The lights were on. I see your dress ready to serve me. But instead of me, instead of you serving me, you kick back, let me have the servant's robe, and I'll wait on you. You go recline at the table because the day has come when I'm going to reward you. That's craziness. But that's what Jesus says, is it not? That He's going to serve them. Reward them. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe, there's your faith that leads to salvation, must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So you already know that Jesus is your Master and Lord. We started off with the verses that told us that. And rightly so, He sets the example for us. So we should follow it, period, because of who He is. But He also says, if you do it, I'm going to reward you for it. Wow, what an awesome God we serve. Wow, that He would love us that much. It's complicated when I think about it, but then I think about it as that little child relationship again with my daddy in heaven. And I think about how if my son does a good job for something that I've told him to do, he might get a reward. Makes a little more sense. But if he's not doing what I asked or told him to do, he might get disciplined. And probably the worst discipline that I could ever do, he said it to me this morning, was say, I'm disappointed. So I live my life to hear that well done, my good and faithful servant. And if I get rewarded on top of that, <laughs> even better, Jesus says I will. He says he'll wait on me. Go recline while I wait on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14 read, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. Someone else, and someone else is building on it. That's us. Paul is, the, Paul is the one who laid the foundation of Jesus Christ. But each of you should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, the day that Jesus comes to take us home and has His reward with Him, will bring everything to light. We already read that in the first of Luke. That what's said in the darkness will come to light and be proclaimed from the rooftops. And if you're ashamed of me and my Father, I will be ashamed of you before the angels in heaven. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If, that, if what has been built survives, the builder will what? There it is again, receive a reward, right? Not just go to heaven, we'll receive a reward. Now, I'm all for Barb, because we talked about it last week, and she said, I don't even think about rewards. That is the most humble spirit to have. 
If she gets it, she gets it. She doesn't even think about it, but right here it is in Scripture that there's rewards waiting for those who diligently seek Him and are obedient and faithful. Wise stewards. I can give you other parables. I think there was a guy that was given ten and got ten more, right? And a guy that was given five and got five more. They were given a lot. And a guy that gave one and buried it in the sand. And what happened to him? I'll let you read it. It's a story for another day. Verse 15 also goes on to say, If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet still be saved. Even though only as one escaping through the flames. I'm not going to go into what that means, but I don't want to be that person. I want to be the one that received the award, not the one that escaped and had fire insurance. Maybe we understand these verses, maybe we don't understand the verses. But the truth is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. These are the words that He spoke. Jesus will be returning to take us home and to reward His true faithful servants. Verse 39 of Luke 12 says, But... So we've got a complete reversal again. Understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house, let his house be broken into. Another completely different example. Now we are the homeowner. If you're the homeowner, you would have your clothes on if you thought the thief was coming that night. You would be prepared and waiting for him. More than likely, you would turn the lights on to deter him. So we have a totally different example here. You would take precautions. You would be doing. Jesus says He will come again to take us home and reward us. Here's what you need to be doing. Dressed, ready for service with your lamps burning. So are you doing that? So He gives us the opposite example now. If you were a homeowner and knew the thief was coming, what would you do to protect what you have? The King James Version says you will not suffer a loss. So you're going to have your rewards or you're going to have losses. I don't know the answers. I just know that Jesus says He will return to take us with Him and He will reward those who diligently seek Him. Verse 40 says then, so if you understand the example given as a Master going to a wedding banquet and returning. And you understand the example of not wanting your home broken into and plundered. Then you also must be ready. Why? Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you least expect Him. Now, do you believe that you're going to heaven. Are you saved? Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? I hope it's a yes. Do you believe Jesus is coming today? Be honest with yourself. Good, Merle. But most of us are going to say probably not. Probability says not. Because there's so many days out there. How would we know that it's today? Right? But by you saying that, guess what? You just increase the probability that it will. Because he said it's at an hour when you least expect him. So think about that. That was a trick question. Either way, you need to be ready, right? So how many more days do you think it'll be? How much more time do you need to get ready? It can happen at any time. Do you think Jesus will come today? I hope you're longing for him to come today when our faith becomes sight when no grave is going to hold us down, when there's no more sin, sorrow, or shame. Luke 12, verse 4, he said, You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect Him. It's been 725,000 days. We're one day closer to His return. Revelation, Revelation 22, 12, Jesus' words are, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. In John 13, he set us the example. Here in Luke, he's telling us to be dressed and ready for service. Jesus also says in Revelation 16, 15, Look, I come like a thief, blessed, or it will be good, for the one who stays awake and remains clothed. 
so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Be dressed, serving, ready for service, with your lamps burning bright. Are you ready? Father, we thank you so much for the love that you've given us, the gift that you have given us through Jesus Christ. Forgive us for taking it so lightly. Forgive us for denying the spirit you have so graciously given us that our forefathers longed for, that the prophets of old never got to see the reality of that, that we get to see the reality of our faith, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High, that we are empowered and sealed by your very spirit. Help us to realize what we are going to obtain when we get to heaven. And help us to realize the task set before us of proclaiming the gospel message, of living a life like Christ, to love even our enemies, to not worry about our own lives, but to live a life for our Master, our Lord, our Teacher. We thank You for Jesus' obedience, because without it He may never have died on the cross for us. Help us to be faithfully obedient servants as we long for the day when Christ returns. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.